Welcome everybody. Today we're going to be talking about working on a tile roof and do you have a plan. So we're primarily focusing on solar installations, but anytime you're working on a tile roof and the roof has a primary purpose of keeping water out, it's something we want to make sure that we maintain the integrity of. My name is John Jensen. I am the training manager for the Tile Roofing Industry Alliance. And you just heard from Lisa Jensen. She is... Victor, you can advance. There we go. Lisa is the training director and she manages the website and will be also monitoring the questions today. So anytime you have a question, go ahead and shoot it to her and she will bring it up to Victor as he's presenting. Again, Victor is the Western Technical Services Rep for Eagle Roofing Products. Worked with him a lot on a lot of different trainings and we appreciate him being uh, here today. A little bit about TRI before we move on. The Tile Roofing Industry Alliance is the Manufacturers Association for Concrete and Clay Tile Producers in the United States. Uh, we have a resource uh, that goes beyond that because they include uh, contractors, accessory manufacturers, consultants, uh, different associations and uh, roofing contractors associations that we partner with across the country to provide any tile roofing professional with the information that they need. You can find that on the website. There's two components to the website as I see it. There's a lot of direct technical information and specific uh, technical briefs. Our manuals are there listed for you to download for free. But also there's contacts for you to be able to uh, reach, contact uh, websites and emails. In addition, there is a map that you'll see that shows where you can find roofing professionals across the country. And uh, Victor, if you go back uh, two slides, One more. There you go. You see that map? Uh, some of you have take a little bit of a leg. Uh, there's a map there on the right that has the green dots on it. The way that you can get on that map as a contractor or a supplier or a roof consultant, any kind of tile roofing professional, is to take one of our manual certification courses. You can advance now, Victor. Uh, there's two courses that will put you on that map. They're both manual certification classes. We are training to the manual in that sense where the manuals are the code body document where it all meets the code and in addition is our manufacturer's instructions for the installation of the tile. We have one for the regular manual which covers 49 states and then one manual specific to Florida and the high wind details required there. And that manual, if you have taken the course before, it's important to recognize we do have a new manual coming out that will take effect at the end of 2020 and going into 2021, any, any jobs permitted will be using, in Florida, will be using that new sixth edition manual. And lastly, we have our short courses, which are free, and you're attending one today. Going forward, we've got uh, uh, one more short course uh, this year. That's what you're here today for. We've got two manual certifications, one for the Florida High Wind, and also one for the regular manual. And we've got two more short courses in January already signed up. You can Find those at tileroofing.org backslash training schedule. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge some of the people that are here today, and it's really what makes our industry and our training program successful. There's some great roofing contractors that I'm familiar with, Renaissance Roofing up in Illinois and Goodman uh, Roofing in Oklahoma, Infinity down in San Diego. And there's people there and, and also at our manufacturers. You see Boral is here in numbers and Eagle and Ludoisi up in uh, Ohio. Uh, we've got people that could be teaching and hopefully will be teaching some of these short courses in the future, and they're here making sure that they're staying up to speed and as knowledgeable as possible on, on the events of the day. So we really appreciate that, and everybody here uh, that's here today to be learning Verde. I see uh, Verde Industries makes a lot of accessory products that can make your installations easier. So thank you all for being here, and I want to introduce Victor Rosas. He is, again, the Western Technical Services Rep for Eagle Roofing Products and he's a great resource for you. His contact information along with ours will be available after the plan, uh, after the presentation. And uh, go ahead and take it away, Victor. Thanks for being here. Uh, thank you very much, John. I really appreciate that. And uh, welcome everybody for uh, attending today's Walking on uh, Tile Roof. Uh, do you have a plan presentation? Um, and this presentation really stemmed from me specifically being uh, in, in Southern California, I do help cover a lot of the Western states um, in regards to uh, 
installation questions and code compliance. Uh, but one of the main things that have been coming up far as a talking point and topic it has been uh, the solar industry working with uh, tile contractors or putting solar on a tile roof. And it really uh, brought this focus on, um, you know, do you have a plan for the roof and have you considered all the aspects of what you're going to plan to do when installing a tile roof? And that's what we're going to walk through. Uh, the, the first point I like to make is, um, you know, a tile roof is a watershedding assembly. Um, and what is what makes up that watershedding assembly? Um, you got your underlayment, you have battens, you have your metal accessories and flashings, and then you have your tile, whether concrete or clay. Um, and really having that thought of watershedding and where is the water going has, has always been a, a point of reference to aspects of installing a tile roof. But it's also important to understand as tile is installed across the nation, um, things that need to be taken into consideration. And this is really focused towards re-roof segment. Um, you know, you got local and state requirements, you know, specifically for California, there's a, a requirement for Title 24, which emphasizes uh, reflectivity and emittance on, on the surfaces of the tiles. And ma us manufacturers are required to do testing and give ratings and have it uh, push through a committee that will uh, certify those ratings. There's also a uh, wildland urban interface, you know, where there's different areas in the country where um, structures are far more vulnerable or are in a high risk fire area. And amber intrusion is a, con is a concern even on a tile roof where most tile and all tile roofs are gonna really be the best option in regards to uh, resistance to uh, fire, right? Because most concrete tile, or excuse me, all concrete tile is class A along with majority of all the clay manufacturers tiles, it's class A fire rating. Then there's wind uplift. Uh, wind uplift uh, compliance, it's gonna be dictated by uh, your local uh, wind zones or type of structure or exposure. Florida, you guys have a whole nother um, compliancy that you guys have to deal with. Uh, you see a lot more foam uh, application there. Uh, for areas where freeze and thaw and snow loads have to be considered, um, it's important to understand uh, what those snow loads are going to be required, especially if you're looking at a re-roof that has an older tile or the home was built in, uh, you know, mid 70s, 80s, or even older 60s, you know, can that roof handle the up updated snow loads and the, the tile that you're planning to use for that roof? Um, and that's where an engineering report becomes a factor, um, you know, just depending on where you are in the country, if you're in a core tile market, you know, engineering reports for a tile to tile re-roof, not as critical, only in the, in the emphasis of having a home that's um, built in the 60s or 70s, or it's got conventional uh, framing, those those things the municipalities may enforce on showing um, that that structure can handle the weight of tile and any other additional uh, live loads. Um, then there's the thought of, you know, what about when you have a re-roof where you're, you're, you're updating that roof from a different material, whether shingles, metal, synthetic, uh, real slate, to tile and is that municipality going to require uh, an engineering report? In most cases, yes. Is that structure in a HOA? You had to get those uh, colors approved. Uh, those are all things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, another detail, not necessarily driven by code compliance or state requirements, is you know what type of eave or fascia detail it, does that structure have and does it need to be updated? Um, I've seen a lot of uh, would shake roofs that have been updated to tile here in California. And uh, there's just not that large fascia uh, detail up front on, on, those, on these roofs uh, that can be updated, that weren't updated. So those are some things to take into consideration um, up front when you're thinking about re-roofing. Um, always gonna dictate what you can and cannot use. Um, in some cases, there are exemptions for complying with uh, Either your your Title 24 or Fire. There's you know there's a lot of great options in regards to underlayments to help qualify your roof as a Class A system or materials that are Class A resistant to to fire or amber intrusion. You know just having all those tools and understanding where you're installing is a factor to having a great plan.
Um, next is going to be identifying, you know, the type of tiles. There's so many tiles out in the market today. Um, whether you're in a market that offers a lightweight product to a standard weight product, it's really important to under, understand uh, what those indicators are to help you identify if it's a lightweight and standard weight. You could simply pick up a piece of tile and, and really tell the difference. Other indicators, some manufacturers have markings or indications, or there's manufacturers that have different dimensions that would be indicators for you to identify the type of weight or type of tile. Um, you know, are you working with a clay tile that's lugged or non-lugged? Does it have a weather check at the nose of the tile? Uh, those are some important factors because uh, those will bring some specific details, whether you're foaming products down to keep in, to keep in mind to uh, keep the aesthetics clean and um, concise and appealing to your consumers' uh, overall um, expectations. So. Once you have an idea of identifying the type of tile that you're working with, and you can always reach out to the manufacturer rep to help you with that or all the different manufacturers, um, it's important to understand the manufacturing process. And, and a common uh, statement, especially when, when you're at a solar company, not a solar contractor, but a solar company that doesn't necessarily have uh, installers experience with tile, whether clay or concrete, um, getting on a roof and not knowing what they're working with. Um, they're either causing damage or they're working on a roof that they just don't understand. And so when it comes to ordering product, you know, the, the quick uh, escape goat for some of those solar companies is that, you know, the tile's bad or the tile isn't um, installed correctly or there's something wrong with the tile. I think that's where understanding the manufacturing process is critical, especially if you're doing a new roof and especially if you're a solar company that wants to be different in the, in the aspect of you can install solar on a tile roof without having to swap out the tile for shingles or some other materials um, and, and understanding that manufacturing process. And I'm just going to briefly walk you through it where it's the raw aggregates that are brought into these manufacturing facilities. They're mixed put into a high extrusion process, uh, coated with the, with a, a, a sealant, and then put into a racking system for curing. And they're cured for several hours, depending on the climate and the area. Um, every manufacturing facility across the country, you know, everybody does something a little bit different um, in order to comply and, and, and uh, take into consideration the variables from the color to the moisture, to the sand content, to the type of cement that they're getting. Um, and once they've been able to cure their product, uh, there's a, a post coating, and then there's the inspection or QCing of the product. Um, and then the uh, tiles are generally um, put into a racking system that will help palletize and stock in the yard. Now, most of all manufacturers will hold their tile for a specified amount of time before and allowing it to leave the the, the plant location. Um, so having an overall understanding of what that process is, you know, tile manufacturers don't just have thousands of squares uh, in their yard waiting to sell. Tile manufacturers make to order, right? And 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 generally uh, those lead times can range depending on where you are across the country. So it's always important to understand what your lead times are for your local tile manufacturers. Um, you know, that can range from a week to, to, to several months in some situations. It just depends on type of year and type of climate that you're exposed to. So that affects your overall plan, right? How does this affect my job? What tile am I using? Where is it coming from? What's the distance that it's traveling? And in most cases, some of those things are bundled up for you by the roofing supplier and they kind of give you a, a direct estimate as to your lead time with all those things considered for you. Um, but it does affect your drying time. So it's always important to understand what tile you are going to be using for your job, uh, placing an order for that tile in an efficient uh, time so that it can be placed, can be manufactured, and it, it, it passes all the local uh, tile manufacturer's requirements for sitting in their yard for a spe specified time frame. Um, and that can that can be different, right? As some local regions have lightweight products or there's standard weight in the majority of the country. Um, one thing I do like to recommend for those contractors on 
um, is, is getting with your local tile manufacturer. And if you're close enough to a plant, take a plant tour, understand this process. Uh, I know that tile manufacturers are more than willing to give plant tours, maybe not at this time of the, of the year due to the certain aspects going on in the country. But, um, you know, once things open back up, I highly recommend taking a plant tour. You learn so much and it's a very marveling uh, process there at the plants. So now that we've kind of really taken into consideration our, our types of tile, the manufacturing process that affects our lead time, um, you know, what else can affect the overall installation of this job? Well, there's always the loading process. And I think loading is something that's, it, it's, a, it's a moving target as everybody across the country does it differently. Um, some, some roofing suppliers will load roofs. Most of the time it's on the roofing contractor. And uh, I have a couple of pictures up here. Uh, these pictures are just an idea of, you know, this this was a re-roof in San Diego County. And, um, you know, when it came to loading the roof, there was limitations on accessibility. And, you know, there's a lot of trees around and these streets were very small. So having a very large semi truck come in with a conveyor belt, you know, had some limitations as well as you had, um, you have a couple of um, cable lines and power lines that would affect and um, dictate safety protocols on where you can load from. So you're looking at a much longer loading process. Um, you know, so access points critical to understanding where you're going to access, how you're going to access it, and what what safety protocols or safety um, steps need to be taken to make sure loaders and installers are safe during this process. Um, you know, what's the street access around the residence? Um, how, how long is this going to increase your typical loading time? Generally, contractors have an average loading time. Um, and uh, do they have a backup loader if a loader refuses to help load, right? Does a contractor have to rent a lift or get scaffolding? For the instance of this roof maybe being steeper, you know, the use of battens, having a walkable underlayment that allows better gripping or traction is, is a factor now, right? So always take it into consideration when you're, when you're doing a bid or when you're helping a contractor to um, get around some questions they may have for loading. There's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration uh, when planning out how to load this roof. And this goes the same for solar contractors where if they were taking on this roof as a solar company and not just doing the solar, uh, installation and doing the roof. Uh, this this is important in the sense that where are they loading the solar panels? What's the access point and where can we minimize the damage? Um, so really important to take into consideration all the aspects when it comes to loading a roof. Next, um, you know, again, depending where you are in the country, uh, your, your typical installation across the country are, are going to use um, battens. Southern California, there's a lot of, in certain parts of California, there's a lot of direct to deck installation, even in somewhere, some areas of the Southwest. Um, what's important here is really understanding the benefit of battens, whether one by two nominal battens or an elevated upgraded batten that you can get from a tile manufacturer. You know, the battens do increase the space between the cheating and the tile, uh, while those very many energy benefits and attributes that, you, that a, a structure can benefit from that by reducing you know the amount of heat intruding into that attic or cold uh, or excuse me maintaining that heat in that structure during those winters um, battens have a lot of other important installation benefits um, especially important for for solar um, if, if any of you have did attend last week's uh, TRI short session you had Gary Manlove on and he he brought it up the the fact that if it's a batten installation or a direct to deck installation, it's going to dictate what type of mounting you're going to be using for your, your solar PV system. Um, so that's always important to take into consideration, especially for solar companies. Next is always going to be, you know, how does, how do battens change my fastening uh, requirements? Uh, depending on your climate, if you're in a high wind zone, that may not be a big factor. Um, battens are very beneficial when it comes to fastening as well as reducing the number, number of fasteners penetrating your underlayment, right? So you have less opportunity for uh, water intrusion depending on the type of underlayment you're using. 
Uh, battens can increase walkability um, and create more a safer uh, atmosphere on that pitch, depending on how how steep it is. Now, batten requirements for 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 tile roofs, you know, not are not necessarily required at all pitches. Uh, when you get 712 and above, it becomes a requirement. But battens can make things simple for, let's say, in Florida where you have a foam installation. Uh, it just makes things a little bit easier, especially if you're working with the tile with a lug on the a backside. Um, battens can also help with uh, spreading out the load for those snow and cold regions. Um, battens can also uh, make for simplicity and replacement of tiles. Uh, there's lots of great benefits to using battens, highly recommended in all installations. Um, you know, the, the biggest downside to a direct to deck installation is the, the thousands of penetrations you're now putting through the underlayment, um, as well as not bending fitting from the, the safety and simplicity of using battens. So always important to take that into consideration uh, when you're planning out your roof. Next, uh, the other important factor I wanted to call out as I have two pictures up, one with battens, it's nice, the stack tiles that are loaded. Uh, are resting on these battens are held in place. Um, and the direct to deck situation, uh, I think this specific photo uh, came from a contract that said a, a, either a mountain lion or a raccoon was on that roof and helped push the stack of tile, or it was just very windy. Whatever the case was, you know, you can get slippage of tile. Um, I know in Florida they do uh, they do wrap uh, their bundles of tile, so you have less chance of that even happening. But direct to deck situation, this is just a, a picture that shows the increased safety and uh, reduced effects of your climates and elements for a direct to deck to a batten use system. Next, uh, this is this this slide uh, is an anatomy slide really for for solar companies that I like to say where not to step, right? Which which is very typical. Um, this roof, let's say, was getting solar. Um, if they were working with a solar contractor, there would be certain access points so that they're not walking over hips and valleys and uh, pipe penetrations or cut tiles where cut tiles are a lot more vulnerable to breakage. Um, so, you know, I, I really like to call out here, A, where not to walk, but B, now we got to take into consideration where we at, where we are in, in the country and, you know, how much um, accessories can make a difference on this installation. How does this affect my overall installation time, right? So let's let's say we are looking for a specific amount of valley and tile pan flashings. Uh, does your local supplier have them and, and do they stock them? If they don't, how does that affect my lead time? Do I have to wait? Is it a special order? Um, another requirement is weather blocking at your hips and ridges. You know, what what material are you going to use to weather block and comply with the tile installation requirements? Whether it's mortar or, ple or plastic preformed product, you know, benefits depending, dictated by uh, requirements for Florida, they, I know they have to use mortar. Other parts of the country, you know, plastic preform may actually speed up the process and give a peace of mind um, when, when installing. And, you know, mortar, obviously there's a lot more prep installation and then cleanup. So you're looking at a lot more lead time. Some some contractors, installers have perfected that, so it doesn't really affect them. Um, so those are some things to take into consideration with your access of the materials you need and the types of flashings you need for a tower roof. How long does that affect you on lead time? And then, you know, take into consideration the types of uh, accessories that are available for a tower roof. You also can see on this roof that there's no dormer vents. This roof does have attic ventilation uh, with uh, profiled vents that essentially replace two pieces of tile. This is aesthetically pleasing. You, you can't see where this roof has ventilation at, um, and it can make a difference on the overall aesthetics of your tile roof. Next, uh, your maximum exposure. Uh, this is something I really like to stress about, and I, I know this is where John can say that the craftsman's aspect of a tile installer really shines and is visible. Um, I have two pictures of, of some bad, uh, not bad on the left, but on the right for sure. But on the left, you can see a change in the exposure as the movement of the tile 
it's, it's not in conjunction with the rest of the plane of that roof. And let's see if I can highlight that for you guys. Um, so in this area, we see that there is a difference, right? Um, that layout from from this section, from the section below to the section up top has changed. And that all, all comes out to, you know, laying out your courses, whether swing tape or not. I know, I know um, there was just a post about this and John probably can, can probably wants this photo on my, on the right where we're seeing if, if the right uh, measures to plan out and, and, uh, and lay out your course correctly, you can have a very beautiful and aesthetic room, uh, tile roof with clean courses and, and lines and angles of, of the way that tile is visible from the naked hour or from curb appeal. Um, if that's not done, you get situations where you now have a short course at your ridge line, and now they may not necessarily um, be out of the minimal overlap, but now we have a um, a, a very I'm trying to look for the right word here, but it, it just isn't aesthetically pleasing. And uh, you can also see that there's raw wood visible, so it's important to plan out your roof. Have your installers take their time to mark out their courses if there's different breaks in the roof. If you have uh, a valley terminating, a dead valley terminating, or you have you know a pitch change or a transition change, um, just making sure that you're taking out the time to plan everything out correctly so that your roof comes out the most. Um, Victor, can I contribute period. on that for a moment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity to just, you've got two great pictures there that help us understand a couple of things. I think most of us tile installers, people with tile roofing experience, understand the value of doing layout. It's not, the aesthetics really matter, but it's not just the aesthetics. We want to make sure we meet that manufacturer's maximum exposure, not go beyond that. And then also that uh, we minimize the, the labor for ourselves by minimizing the cutting. And and the roofer on the right, he, he minimized the cutting, um, but it, <laughs> But he gave himself this extreme short course that's it's just ugly. Um, yep. And in addition, the tile are not going to to nest the way that we want them to when you have that great of an overlap. So you know he would have been able to do layout. I won't go into that at all. Just other than to say we do have resources, online articles if anybody's interested in easier layout. But I do want to point out something because the picture on the left also uh, the picture on the right helps us understand what's happening there. If the exposure, the, the width of the horizontal rows were identical all the way up the roof, every single row was identical. When you looked at the diagonal side laps that, that you're seeing there, that when you when you looked at them diagonally, they would also be one straight diagonal line up the roof because the dimensions, the geometry would be exactly the same. Obviously, if you look at this extreme case on the right, it, it kind of exaggerates you can see how that diagonal line would change from the row that's partly cut off at the bottom, it's going almost vertical, and then that diagonal line that your eye catches in the picture on the left, the one on the right, you'd see it would take a sharp jog to the left, it would follow that up. So that's what's happening there. There's just a change in the horizontal exposure, the width of the rows on that picture on the right. That's important to know, especially for you, you solar guys that might go up and take up a section it, there's nothing wrong with it, as Victor said. It's not fundamentally wrong. It doesn't break the manufacturer's spec as long as the exposure is not greater than the maximum allowed. But it will provide this opportunity to see a change in the diagonal exposure. So if your homeowner says, hey, you know, where you guys put the solar on that field, um, we noticed this, this change. You want to be able to look at that and say, you know, that's because we aligned the rows properly, made sure they met the manufacturer's maximum exposure, and we wanted to ensure we had, gosh, alignment with a great transition flashing, a soaker flashing at the bottom, or, hey, there's two ridge lines there. If you understand why that's showing up that way, it's better than if you scratch your head and say, gosh, I have no idea why that looks like that. So those are the kind of things that we can help you with. Send Victor or I a note, and we can send you the articles and some videos we have on that. Uh, thanks, Victor. I just wanted to, that's, those are two great pictures that really demonstrate the layout detail. Yeah. Yeah, I knew you'd appreciate that, John. Uh, moving on, guys. Um, let me see the slide moves. All right, there we go. So um, minimizing breakage on a roof. I think this is probably one of the areas that are very critical uh, when it comes to uh, solar 
um, installers, whether a solar company installing or a, a contractor that's working with the solar company, uh, the way to minimize breakage and any headaches on a roof um, is really comes down to the contractor and solar company working in conjunction. Um, if they can come to a designated roof plan with the contractor, uh, which would detail an agreed upon foot traffic area, right, whether marked off or detailed on um, an eagle view or some type of uh, way that they can communicate that through email or PDF, marking off where solar installers can install their PV systems that are not necessarily work worrying about the rest of the roof, just the area where the PV system has been designated to be installed uh, can really minimize, you know, the the situations where you have unexperienced solar installers walking on parts of the roof that could cause breakage or damage to that roof that now then needs to be replaced or could lead to um, leaks or intrusion of water into that tile system, as well as designated access points. We don't we just don't want the con the solar companies to necessarily access points where you're just going to walk past the valley over a hedge and then get to your field area where there may be a different access point that minimizes uh, any opportunity for breakage, as well as uh, kind of walking through the protocols or the procedures on how to replace those broken tiles. Without a doubt, there's going to be broken tiles uh, when it comes to solar installation. Um, in the instance that a roofing contractor goes in, has the solar company detail where the solar standoffs or, or penetrations will be in the solar, or excuse me, on the roofing contractor takes the time to uh, comply with the TRI double flashing at the deck level and at the tile level, flash all those standoffs. Now the solar company can have a designated plan where to access so that they are just going up to that roof plane and uh, installing the railing system and then the PV panels. Um, and, and it's a fundamental aspect for a tile installer, but for a solar company, you know, point loading on a tile is what leads to breakage. Um, and it's something that I've had to cover with some solar companies on, on where to walk and how to walk on tile. Uh, it's a very fundamental aspect of working on a tile roof, um, but it's important to understand, you know, how can we minimize the breakage on the tile roof and, you know, the solar companies that have worked with roofing contractors that have really minimized it have gone with this situation of designating a roof plan and coming upon agreements on how they're going to, A, install it when after the solar company or excuse me after the roofing contractor has finished the roof solar company comes in installs their pv system and they are responsible for any breakage this benefits both parties roofing contractor has less worry of uh, breakage and intrusion of, of water from uh, the solar company and the solar company has uh, a, a smaller time frame on that roof gets that pv system installed and installed uh, correctly with minimal breakage, which means they don't have to they have to spend less time there replacing tiles. So this works out for everybody. And if this is a, a way that uh, solar companies can work with roofing contractors, this is the one way that we see has been the most beneficial for both parties. Um, or you get a situation where you have a solar company comes in and they don't have the experience of a tile installer, and uh, I got these two pictures because you know this this is a this was a tile a flat tile roof that was virtually beautiful and and obviously this this homeowner wanted tile but you know the solar company came in and gave them a solution that was probably advantageous in the sense that it wasn't highly costly and um, you know it was doable in the sense that they just decided to remove all the tile from ridge to eave and install solar. Um, which may have made things sim simple for the solar installer. Uh, but now the thought of this is that homeowner has two different materials on their roof, tile and shingles. And, uh, you know, that shingle may go out before that tile. And in order to replace those shingles, they had to remove those solar PV systems uh, in order to maintenance those. Um, at, along with aesthetics, you know, it's not as pleasing. Um, and, and, they put a break between the tile and the shingles. Um, you know, there's a lot of rogue or gorilla um, details that have been put out in the industry that necessarily won't work or have worked for maybe commercial aspects, but on a residential roof, 
um, you know, they could have gone with mounting this on a tower roof, but decided not to. A um, lot of things to take into consideration, right? Was it a lightweight product? Um, you know, why did they decide to go with shingles? Was it just simpler in the sense that they had an easier mounting system to use? Um, what was presented to the homeowner? Um, this is this is the end result of, in my opinion, an unexperienced solar company coming in and giving an option of just using solar. There's other inst instances that I've heard of where you have a uh, architect who has a owner of a building that they're planning out to do solar but the contractor or solar company is saying they, they can't do it over tile it's just not feasible which is just not the truth it's very feasible it just depends on what route you want to go with the the more stringent and code compliant method or you know alternative methods whether it's a solar well like you see here or um, an inexpensive route it just really depends and and solar companies have the opportunity to dictate that or a contractor that works with a solar company can have it done the right way and working with conjunction with the solar company, get it to look aesthetically pleasing with a tile roof under, uh, with, excuse me, with PV panels on top of that. So it really just depends um, um, how it's brought to. And, and, and I think we as tile industry individuals, we have the ability to bridge that to communication to solar companies that it's very feasible to install PV systems on the tile roof. Um, Kind of just threw this in just to make sure to cover it. You know, foot positioning, uh, how I'm walking on tile. Wanted to make sure just the avoiding of the point loading. This is where this benefits comes in of, of uh, the fundamental aspect of walking on tile, which is walking at the overlap portion, right? It's a requirement for the TRI manual to overlap a minimum of three inches. And that's where our weight transfer would be as we step on our on tiles and, and putting our feet horizontally on the um, nose of the tile or the butt end of the tile so that that weight is transferred to the deck wherever that tile is fastened. Uh, really critical to understanding uh, and minimizing breakage of tile. Don't want to be that guy that gets on the roof and you're breaking a tile every single time re regardless of uh, your weight or not. It's just, I, I, it's been, I've been that guy before and I don't want to be that guy ever again. So uh, I understand when people say they don't, they just can't walk on a tile roof, which you can, it's just there's a right way. And people have taken some other routes of trying to uh, improve walkability with either foam application or using um, ISO board, which is a uh, foam installation on a piece of plywood and spreading out that load across multiple pieces of tile or courses. Uh, that has been some um, alternative routes to minimizing breakage, uh, but that has always worked out the way it should have for those people. Uh, and that kind of brings us to the end on, on what brings us to this presentation, which is, you know, planning out your roof. Um, and, and if you have questions, uh, it's always important to reach out to your local tile manufacturer or roof consultants, or you have the, the TRIA, um, which are 100% available, as well as myself. Uh, we are here to make sure that all solar uh, roofs or all solar PV systems can be installed on a tile roof, along with any tile roof contractor um, has their their questions answered, whether for trying to comply with a comp to tile uh, requirements from a local municipality to any state or uh, local special codes that may be enforced on them or determining how to comply with your general uplift factors, whatever it is, um, you know, there are endless amounts of resources around the country that are here to help you be successful when installing a tile roof. Um, kind of gonna pass it back to you, John. We got one sure. more slide for you guys, but if there's any questions, Lisa, that we can address that may have come across throughout the presentation. There's, there's, one, question on, uh, there's one question on counterbattens, Victor, but I wanted to kind of address a little bit. You know, Victor is uh, a manufacturer's technical rep. I'm a roofing contractor. And so I wanna take a, a moment to look at it a little bit from that perspective where as a roofing contractor when we're up on the roof we're installing a roof that's what we're doing all day our primary concern is that primary purpose of that roof is the roof covering and what i've seen and in, in the the sad thing is some of the worst cases where where we've gone and had a solar company that's gone to install solar on a tile roof it can be frustrating for the solar contractor too because they they may not have the experience with that uh, our job is to help you we we want it and we know it can be successful but I, I want to talk about a couple of worst case scenarios. Um, as a roofing contractor, uh, Victor, he moved a slide to the back of the program for me. 
his program is, is how to facilitate, you know, working on a tile roof. I think I had originally titled it Don't Break My Roof. Um, you know, we, we we put this roof on it and, and we don't want to see it damaged. Um, but you're up there with your crew and it's very different because your primary job or the primary focus of, of the job that you're doing on those days is installing solar. It just happens to be on top of our roof. So a couple things I want to point out. Number one, Victor's focus on, on where you are and how you walk on the tile, avoiding cut tile, avoiding valleys, avoiding certain details like that, that just helps you. If you break a full tile, you just have to take a new full tile and replace the tile. But if you break a cut tile, aside from it being more fragile in the first place or more, more temperamental because it's cut, it's not nesting properly or totally on the tile below it, then your weight's not transferred. You also have to cut a tile if you need to replace it. So we want to avoid that. The other thing is, you may only be working on 25 or 30 or 40 percent of the roof in total. So the worst case scenarios that I've seen, 80 percent of the roof has damage. And that's where a plan, like he's talking about, where are your people going to access the roof? Not in a different place every day. Uh, you want it to be convenient, but not necessarily the most convenient. You also want to minimize your liability for that roof by minimizing the amount of space that you're covering and working and walking on that roof. And the last thing I'll say is that if you do start to run into a problem, call us, get a hold of Victor, get a hold of somebody at the manufacturer of the tile you're working with, call a roofing contractor that you're familiar with that can help you. I remember when I was first doing tile and was less familiar with it, I called my rep on about the third job and said, hey, I have a, I have some tile that look different, you know, than, than the rest of them. And he said, oh, it's a, it's a different batch number. We'll take care of it. I thought that was great. I went ahead and continued installing the tile, including the one that was the different batch number. And when the sales rep got to the job to say, Where, where's the pallet of the mismatched tile? I said, I installed it on the back. Well, that's ridiculous. He would have gladly just given me a new tile. But once I've gone up and put all that energy and labor into installing it, you know, we've got a, a bit bigger, deeper problem. If you're working on a roof and you're having difficulty, call somebody right away. Get, get the expertise and the input and the education that you need um, so that we can help you at that point. Uh, but there's a degradation of care. Uh, when you're on a roof, and I know it myself from doing repairs, when you're on a roof and you break a tile and you go, darn it, you know, I'm gonna be more careful, but your focus is on the repair or whatever your task is that day. By the third day, your people or my people, you know, it's like they're delivering tile with a lawn tractor on the roof or something. You see that much damage. There's no reason for these to be that significant. And I think sometimes our solar installers say that was such a bad experience, we don't think we can do it. And that's that's the wrong approach. We can help you. So that's just the message I want to get across. The resources are here. It's more than possible. We can give you insight and, and we really want to help you. So we do have some questions coming in. So before we get to them, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things on battens. Um, in the regular manual, which covers 49 states, battens are required when you're above 712. In Florida, they're always optional. So just a clarification there. And then the question we had uh, was from Jim Butters. It was about counter battens, and he's on a job now where he sees counter battens. And I don't know if there was a specific question. So Jim, if you want to elaborate on that, um, that is probably something John will cover in the presentation on the 21st of January, just uh, when he talks about battens, raised battens and counter battens and some of the benefits. Um, but we do have some information on uh, our website. There's some, or actually our YouTube channel, which is accessible from our website on the counter batten and raised batten installations. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else, John, and then I'll get to the next questions. Uh, no, Victor, if you have anything to add there, I didn't want to leave you out of picture there. No, no, nothing to add there. Yeah, I'd be curious to see what the specific counterbatten question is. Okay. And then um, Gary Manlove is, uh, has the question, which I'm not sure if we can answer it, but uh, if you have a roof installed and the contractor has a five-year performance warranty, and in year four, a solar installer installs solar on the tile, um, who now covers the performance warranty? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and and in, in some cases, you know, if a solar company is coming in and getting on a, a roof that is 
was installed by another contractor, they're going to void, that solar company is going to void any existing warranty on that roof. That's why, you know, I, I think I said it a couple of times, if a solar company is working in conjunction with a roofing contractor or the original installer of that roof, you know, I think the performance warranty uh, situation is kind of, it works itself out where the contractor, as long as they're under uh, under agreements on how that solar system is being installed on that solar contract on that contractor's roof, you know they can work that plan out. Uh, the most success I have seen is when a solar company who's not trying to do the whole roof themselves or own that roof works with the roofing contractor that is uh, experienced and a certified applicator. Um, come to an agreement on what the existing warranty is and what that solar company is responsible for once they install their PV systems. I would assume that in in that in Gary Manlove's uh, question is, thus nobody's going to take responsibility for that performance <laughs> warranty, and it's going to avoid it in most cases. So Gary also says, don't forget that permits could be required for any solar install and. Uh, roof portion if it's over a certain number of squares in some areas and then that we had correct. another yeah another um, comment from Eric DeRoos um, who if you guys are on our uh, LinkedIn group uh, he just posted some nice pictures of a recent project but he says he's I see a lot of broken tiles caused by gutter cleaners especially in HOA communities just another mm -hmm. exposure of broken tiles that needs to be addressed with all involved um, and one thing I would add on that is, particularly when you're dealing with homeowners or homeowners associations, uh, for our business, uh, John used to have a deal with some uh, homeowners associations that before anybody worked on the roof, he would go clear a path for them. Um, so it's a, a business opportunity, if you will, for some of the contractors, if you have a good relationship with your homeowner or homeowners association, um, neither of them like to see broken tile on their roofs. So uh, sometimes that they will be willing to pay for somebody to come and lift, pick up some tile to clear a path and then come back and put the tile back in place when the work is done. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, one of, one of the ideas and, and many of the solar companies and Victor and I have worked with quite a few where, you know, there's a real interest in getting some of that basic training to, to work with the tile. Um, and that's the most frustrating thing for me is to see anybody discouraged in working with tile. And, I was just involved in a, a huge, huge to me, 90 square home in Northern California where a solar system was installed and functioning, uh, but the entire roof was just replaced. And the reality was only about 30% of that 90 square roof had solar on it. And they, they did have to go to the back side of the roof, but I could have been hired or one of my guys could have been hired for about two hours and they could have gone up and picked up a row of four tile wide to give them access to put a ladder up on the front of the house and literally walk all of the materials and panels up to the rear. I'm not saying that would have solved all of their problems, but it would have cut the damage that they caused directly to the tile in half. And that may have made the difference between this being a repairable situation and it being something that there was, it was very difficult to defend that the roof needed to be redone. So just again, you know, we're here to help. We really want to. This isn't meant to, to, to take somebody that's not ready to go out there and, and, and do a roof to, to be 100%, but we've got the resources. There's people on this call that can help you. And so, you know, please, please contact us before you get in trouble. Uh, Victor, do you have anything else to add or are there any other questions, Lisa? I don't see any other questions. Uh, the only thing I would like to say is just thank you guys again for uh jumping on this short session and I want to wish everybody happy holidays and a safe new year. Very good. Victor, back at you and, and congratulations on your on your new baby. I think they're both there uh, ready to make noise as soon as you get off. Uh, thank you everybody for being here and if there are some of you on this call that are interested in doing a presentation, if you think you have something that would be of value to uh, our other Alliance members, you know, get a hold of us. We're happy to do that. Our contact information is there and you can always find us on the website. So look forward to seeing you soon, and uh, if not uh, uh, sooner on a call or a webinar. Uh, have a great holiday season, a great Christmas, and uh, everybody take care. We look forward to hearing from you.